This is Amateur Logic, episode 199, for November 15th, 2024. Amateur Logic is brought to you by ICOM. This holiday season, elevate the amateur radio experience with ICOM. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. Uh, I'm Emil. And I'm Mike. And it's great to be back on this uh, well, chilly November evening, especially if you're outside. Yeah, George, it is uh, approaching the 40s down south, which is uh, rare for us, but uh, definitely cooler out here. And uh, it's uh, taken I'm getting used to with the short sleeves, so... <laughs> Yeah. I, might have, I might have to put on a sweater later. Well, you've moved a little to the north there, so you're going to have to get used to our climate. <laughs> That's right. I'm above I-10 now. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to do. Yeah. It's a whole different <laughs> weather pattern. Yeah. Uh, good to be back tonight. We've got a fun show lined up. Uh, Tommy, what's been going on over uh, there? Not a whole lot. Uh, got, out, got some of my gear out and got... Oh, you look at my, my mic. I was trying to see what your shirt. Shot. No, I was trying to see what your shirt said. Pilot Institute. Oh, for your drone. Yeah, drone pilot. Okay. Yeah, that's where I took my class. So I do have some class, or I did. You did. <laughs> you had to pay for it, though. Yeah, I had to pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, got uh, got my uh, gear out. I think I'm gonna try my hand at some parks on the air stuff coming up. So, cool. we'll see a little bit more about that shortly. Yeah. Email? Uh, well, did did you get run out of the house, or what's going on there? <laughs> yeah, uh, so over here, the shack is not quite built yet, so I'm, uh, I'm just actually enjoying the outdoors here, because it's, it's really nice with this weather. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I could get used to this. And notice sure. the ceiling fan's not on. It is not on. <laughs> Normally, it's on to keep the bugs uh, guessing and flying into other stuff instead of me. But tonight, no, they're not. There's not a bug in sight. So it seems like you're enjoying this outdoor life. You know, I was raised outdoors by wolves. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> but I was raised in the country, so yeah, it's it's different than living in town for sure. You can Absolutely. step out side and you know you you'll hear some gunfire during hunting season but you know not normally during the day like you, you do in town so. no i've i've, I've oh, experienced no. <laughs> i've experienced all of that uh actually uh not the town part but now that i'm out in the country every once in a while you do hear some hunters and in their hounds yeah uh, so it is that season too this year in I can't tell you how many times already driving down some of the uh, highways down here that we've avoided deer just hopping right across. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. a real problem around here, too, especially around the Natchez Trace. Yeah. Mike, what are things like up there? Have the moose come out yet? Uh, I haven't seen the moose, um, but um, it, it is definitely getting colder. Uh, it's getting down to below freezing at night. So, uh, you notice I'm wearing flannel. Yes. <laughs> Long sleeves. That's the official Canadian uniform, right? Yes. Uh, flannel is the tuxedo of Canadians. <laughs> or the tini- <laughs> Canadian tuxedo, I should say. Okay. Uh, flannel shirt and blue jeans. Canadian tuxedo. Okay. I like uh, your background there tonight. That's... That's a yeah, did, did everybody uh, get the memo? Yeah, we I brought, did. I brought, I brought mine. I got mine. Got mine. Mine's still in the case. Oh, oh, you got the deluxe model with the leather case. Now, if you look on the uh, the meter movement, um, just below the two hundred and sixty, it'll say what the series is. Um, Seven's a series three. Mine's a 7M. 7 mirrored. Right, right below oh, oh. 260. Series 6. 6. Okay. 
Now, I was on the, uh, if you go to Simpson260.com, um, you can download manuals for all the various series. Oh, cool. um, in this particular one, the Series 3, I found out it's um, from 1958-ish. Wow. So, yeah. Um, they started with the Series 2 after the original model, as I was reading some of the history on that uh, website. And it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, they, they, I think they went up to what? What is it? Series seven for the uh, model two hundred and sixty. Um, and now, of course, they've they got fancier models uh, since then. But um, but uh, yeah, you should check it out. Um, Simpson two hundred and sixty dot com. Yeah, that. and you know it it is sacrilege to put Duracell batteries in these. Yeah, oh, do no. Anything. Uh, you don't want to do that. Email, are you going to show us your Simpson? Uh, you know, George, y'all know I'm the cheap old man. And I, <laughs> the one thing I love about those Simpson meters is the shiny, nice little thing where you can see the parallax and the meter motion in there. And my my version of that, if you, <laughs> if you really pay attention when you stick it in to, to the probes into the uh, outlet, to, to read the voltage, you can kind of see it right here, your reflection of the meter is moving, the hair. You know, I, the more it stands up, the, uh, the, the the meter movement is pretty good, the action. So, yeah, I got my Simpson, George. The higher the hair stands up, the more voltage. That's yeah. right. Does it work better in a thunderstorm? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and if you're standing in the water, yep. Yeah, so don't try that at home, people. My you know? interestingly enough, my uh, I, I see yours doesn't eat, or does it? Does yours have the uh, the mirror? Mine does. Mine does not. George's does. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for for parallax error. Yeah. Does yours? Mine. No. No. Yeah, that you, not a lot of them do, and people don't know what that's for, really. I mean, well, if you're old like us, you do, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't see a lot of them, I don't guess, with with mirrors. I, I just crossed my eyes. You can see the the reflection mm -hmm. right here in the in the hair, you know. Well, you know, you brought that thing on before the show, and I had to try that out for myself, and it rebooted my T-shirt. <laughs> That's what happened. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know um, if you put because the voltage on an alkaline battery is slightly different than a. A, a carbon zinc battery. I wonder if that changes the uh, the measurements you're making from the meter. If it needs to be recalibrated with uh, with uh, alkaline batteries in it or not. Good question. Show us your probe. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Turn it around. I'll show no. you. <laughs> you you've got banana plugs. Yeah. Regular male banana plugs. Yeah. This one has females. What does yours oh, okay. have, Mike? Well, I don't have I don't have the probe set for mine, but mine looks like it's just got banana jacks on the front panel. Yeah, well, for some reason this one had females on it, and if you remember uh, a few months back, somebody wrote us about these right here. I had to order a set. Oh, the from converters. Amazon. Yeah, it's a female on both ends. Right. So you can plug that in there, and you can use regular probes with it. Interesting. Emil's has four-prong connector. <laughs> oh, it does. Yeah. Special. Yes, very specialized, uh, and, highly. And, and stainless steel, too. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to tarnish in the dishwasher. Yeah. Yep. The silver is uh, good conduction. You know, really, uh, it even has a thing where you could put it on your tongue so you don't swallow your uh in case your hands probes. are busy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay oh. well enough of that um i got an email here this came from kenny w2krt hi george the package arrived today thank you and amateurlogic.tv for hosting this awesome event you may remember that uh kenny w2krt won the Amateur Logic 19th Anniversary Contest. The package arrived. The Eagle has landed. We got awesome. the IC702, the Intellitron antenna, uh, power supply, and Messi and Poloni coax. He's in good shape. So yeah, thanks. Congratulations again. Yeah. 
Congratulations. Thanks for sending the note along. Mm -hmm. And be interesting here. We wanted to test that antenna out ourselves, but just I had to ship it. You know, we'd yeah. given it away, so we didn't didn't get a chance to. But that price, man, that's pretty tempting. Yeah, I'd be interested uh, as well to find out uh, how well it works. Um, yeah. Because the the uh, the original, I guess, Outbacker that it's based on, mm -hmm. uh, I don't even know if they make those anymore. Um. I I want to say I did see them, but I don't know that they're sold in the U.S. and they're very very expensive. Email. Did you have a, a Facebook post or anything you want to share with us tonight? You know, George, I did. It's a, it's a Facebook post from one of the show's uh, long term long time friends, Jerry Boyd, uh, WR Five G. This was back in actually late October, and he was talking about switching over to um, a uh, different company for internet access in his location in uh, Texas, I think. He was asking people how deep uh, providers bury in the, the uh, fiber property, you know, up to the lead coming from the source to the house. And uh, I know he was kind of worried because he saw they only really buried about two inches deep. And, George, I saw you actually replied to that saying that they did some uh, flex conduit or flex uh, tubing that goes about six inches deep and I think I'm in the same boat as you there from the pole buried under coming up to a box that's on the house on the side and uh, you know I guess now that I'm in the country there's a lot of people with backhoes around here yeah <laughs> and attachments <laughs> that could definitely do some damage so he was really worried about that and there's, there was a lot of feedback there's probably a lot of different contractors doing different things. I guess you just got to know where not to dig. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, hopefully it goes a little bit deeper, but, you know, it varies greatly. But I noticed he said two gig he's got two gigs up, two gigs down. That's pretty impressive. You yeah, can, we can get that tier. It's like, what, an extra $15 a month? Is something. that all? I hadn't really priced yeah. it. But, I mean... You can't use one gig. Yeah. I mean, not, nothing, <laughs> nothing will fill it up. Now, I, I was guessing they buried mine six inches. I didn't actually go out and dig it up and try to measure it. Mine's about... You think it's a you, foot? I know my, mine is because I went out there and looked at it. When well, it mine could be that deep. I don't know. They use a little trencher. But as far as the flex conduit, Emil, no, that's only right here at the shack. It it comes from the box on the wall. It goes down into the ground about six inches and flex conduit, and from there it's just just fiber. The flex doesn't run all the way out to the street. Okay, so armor cable or something they got on the ground, hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> if not, they'll be replacing it. <laughs> yep. Tommy? What? You've been getting excited about an event that you that you're going to create yourself. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, been threatening to do the parks on the air thing. Yeah. So if that works out, well, let's watch it, then I'll have some comments at the end. Well, I think I'm going to finally break down and do it. I'm going to try my hand at parks on the air. So I've gotten set up on the website. Go to parksontheair.com. If you don't already have an account there, create one. First, let's go to Maps of Entities, Parks on the Air Map. Use our current location. And you can see all the parks that are around you, or you can go to other areas and look. This one is actually really close to my house. You've seen this park on the show before. Uh, George and I have gone out there. I went out there with the Jack Amateur Radio Club field day before. It's a pretty pretty nice little park around here. I'll probably do that one. Uh, once I get my technique down and make sure my gear is okay, and everything's working well, and I might venture out for a little bit farther, but um, try a close one first. So let's go ahead and sign in. When you, when you log in, it's going to take us to this active spots page. It's going to show you all the ones that are active right now. It refreshes every minute or two also. So this one's going to show you that W7PCT is activated in uh, the park in Columbia River Gorge National Forest, actually. And there's the identifier for it, US0731 in Oregon. He's on 18084. Last heard five seconds ago. Last heard five seconds ago. Eight seconds ago. 
Yeah, these these are this one's in Washington, Oregon, Kentucky. To work it, you can either need to be an activator or a hunter. So I'm going to try my hand at being an activator. Although I was a hunter one time, I didn't even don't even remember it. So if I go over here to my call sign, click down to hunter log, you can see that I made a contact with this guy KD4DQP on single sideband in South Carolina at that park on April 13th of 2021. So three years ago. And a, three and a half years ago almost. You either can be a hunter or an activator. So what? Do, how do you activate? So we can go in here and do an add activation if you want to set it up ahead of time. And you don't have to do that, but you, but you certainly can. Or you can go in and you can spot yourself, which is probably what I'll do. And I'll go in, activate myself, uh, my call sign, and I'm spotted by myself. And I'll put my frequency, maybe, uh, I don't know, 7250, whatever. And my park will be there, and I'm going to be on single sideband. There's, there's some hints down here, too, if you're not sure what to do. So you can mention your mode in the comments. You can put a switch into FT8 or whatever if you want to notify people that you're going to change modes and so forth. So I'll do that in spot. And then when I do that, it's going to show up on this page that we were on with my call sign that I spotted myself frequency that I'm on and the mode that I'm working on and that lets people know that I'm out there ready to get some, make some QSOs. All the responsibility is on the activator so if you at least this is the way I understand it so be sure you take some logging software or pencil and paper which is probably what I'm going to do and be sure to log everything so you want to do uh, you want to log the Call sign, the time, the frequency, everything. Just kind of like you were doing field day. Uh, most of the time you give, I hear them giving signal reports. Uh, you can also do a park to park. If uh, Typically park to parks are kind of given a little preference. So if you hear a bunch of people on a pile up for you and you, and you hear a park to park, you, most of the time people kind of stop and take those. You don't have to, but it's kind of courtesy to do that. At least that's my understanding. The hunters, you give the parks, the guys at the park, the uh, contacts, and the guy at the park does all the work. So how do we log it? You can use uh, any of the logging software that supports parks on the air. I think the uh, one that George and I use for field day, I'm pretty sure it does, and there's some others. You guys probably know more about it than I do, but I'm going to use paper and pencil. So you can go through here and upload your logs. Uh, that just anyone that will export it in that ADIF format will work. Uh, upload them here, and then your, people show, your contacts with you will show up on their Hunter log like you saw mine earlier. I'm probably missing big parts of this because I haven't actually done it yet, so bear with me. We're going to go out in the next few weeks and try it and I'm probably going to either I know I'll learn as I'm going so so we got to get started somewhere right okay well let's uh let's go take my gear out and I want to go over it I've got an antenna from MFJ that I wanted to try out I haven't actually set it up yet so that's what I'm thinking about using because I want my cut my kit to be kind of compact when I travel and go places with my family, I'd like to be able to take it and not take a lot of extra room in the car. Today I'm going to go through my kit, test it all out here in my backyard park and make sure everything is working and then the antenna is working like I, like I want it to or like I think it should anyway. It's the uh, MFJ 1898, I believe was the part number of it. I got it from MFJ right before they announced that uh, Martin was going to retire. They were going to close the doors, but there's still some of these left if you're interested in one of them. I looked on their website and saw it. I cut a couple of counterpoise wires, one for 20 meters, one for 40 meters. So I'm going to hook that up. And as far as my antenna, I've got a bracket I'm going to mount to this uh, ground rod, short ground rod that I'm going to drive into the ground here. And see, I've also got a tripod, but I'm trying to keep it, the uh, bulk, small, the one I take with me. Uh, unfortunately, I'll have to carry a hammer and a pair of vice grips probably to pull it out of the ground, but that's okay. So let's take a look at my kit and see what I got here I'm going to set up. 
Gonna be using my Icom IC705. You've seen many times on the show. My favorite radio. And I've got some coax here, a little short piece of coax I'm gonna run to my antenna. I've got my bag of wires and connectors. I've got my UR kits, SWR analyzer to test the antenna. I've got a little rubber duck I keep in here in case I want to get on the D-Star or something. And I've got my AH705 tuner I'm going to be using. My Miati battery, my 8 amp hour one you've seen on here numerous times. I've got my Bluetooth headset, which I, I won't fool with that today, but I will use it later when we actually really go to the park. Hopefully that'll be next month. I've got the antenna mounted on here. I've got the rod drove into the ground about a foot, foot and a half. Enough for it's kind of sturdy. I don't want to have a hard time pulling it out. So, not here. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and extend the whip. I think it's about 103 inches long, if I'm not mistaken. Eh, maybe. Have to measure it sometime and see. But the way it works is there's a nut down here you loosen and then you can raise up the antenna to change it, the tap on here that you can hear there's a coil in there and there's a little tap that's rubbing across it clicking now there was there wasn't a manual in the pack of mine i don't know if there's one that comes with the other ones but i'm gonna have to figure out where to put it so i'm on to, that's one reason why we're setting it up today instead of doing this out at the park so i'm gonna go ahead and just put it somewhere around six maybe i don't know Tighten that up a little so it don't slide. And let me get the coax hooked up in the tuner. And again, I'll be right back. I'm not sure how this is going to show on here, but you can see, hopefully you can see that the SWR is way off. I've got it set for 7.4, 7. 7 7.2 in the 40 meter band. It's way off, so I'm going to try changing this coil it should probably be longer so let's pull it up oh look at that you can see it in real time that it changes so what i'm gonna do is get it close and then i'm gonna mark that down and uh actually it's gonna be on the video and i'm gonna mark it down later yeah one click down from 13 is is about as good as i'm gonna get it that's a swr 1.3 that's no tuner or anything. So now let's let's change to 14 megahertz, like I said. I'll do uh, 14.2 again. So, and let's bring it down again. Hopefully you can see that. If not, I'll just try to have to get some pictures of it, put it in the video. This antenna is supposed to work with, uh, I believe it's uh, 40 through six meters. Yes, yeah, seven. 7 through 30 and 50 megahertz. Got about a 1.6. That's for uh, 20 meters. Let's let's go over here and turn on the rig and let's see what we can hear. We'll run it through the tuner. Well, I had to get out my universal socket set to tighten up the uh, bracket over there. So anyway, got a little extra piece of gear I need to remember to take with me. Let's turn on the rig. I've got, so this is our setup so far. This is pretty much everything I'm going to need to take with me. We've got the 705, we've got my cell phone with uh, Parks on the Air website on. I'll show you that in a bit. I've got my tuner hook set up, my little rubber duck there that stays in my bag. I probably won't use it. My antenna analyzer you just saw, and my battery, and it's all hooked up over here. I've got my speaker mic. Okay, so let's go over to 20 meters, 14 megahertz. So we turn the audio up. Let's, uh, for fun, let's see if we can find somebody on Parks on the Air. Okay, it's the Parks on the Air website, parksontheair.com. The link will be in the show notes, so it's on the bottom of the screen. So let's uh, log in, and I'm already logged in with my account, so let's see what we can find on 20 meters. Here's one. Oh, he's on CW. 
FT4. So this one's 14257. So let's see what we can find over on 14257. See what else is on here. Here's one fourteen two ninety six, North Carolina. There he is. Four eight five eight. Let's see if we can try to get this guy. November 5, Zulu, November Oscar. Well, I give up for tonight. It's getting dark out here. The camera's not going to be working too well here in a few minutes. Let's pack all this stuff up and we'll try it out at the park next week or two. Looks like you're set up for some POTA action. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I did try more than just the one time you saw me do it there. I cut a lot of that out for the video because it was getting too long. But yeah. if the park's on there, thing works out. I'm going to try to go down and see a meal down there and see do the SWOTA. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I tried Backyards on the Air, Biota, <laughs> and then who knows? I might do something different. Maybe McDota, McDonald's on the Air. I don't know, something. Yeah. <laughs> who, who knows? It's, sky's the limit. Yeah. Hey, when you get going, I might have to do some SWOTA in a couple yeah. of months. Yeah. Tommy, I got a suggestion for you. Uh, you. You Something you said in that segment caught my eye. And knowing how I use the ground rods for my uh, portable station with HF, get you a pair of good gloves to rip that <laughs> out of the ground. Oh yeah, because uh, you can yeah, especially with the ones with the grips on the inside here, uh -huh. you can, can kind of see that because you grabbing that, you know, post up, it it, it does get pretty. Uh, yeah, I I got a pair of big. I actually bought a pair from Har uh, Horror Fraught. What is it? Hazard Fraught. Hazard Fraught. <laughs> uh, horror Freight. Big yeah, Horror <laughs> Freight. Uh, uh, vice grips, and I used that to pull it up. But uh, the gloves are a good idea too. They'd be easier to carry around. Yep. Well, yeah. along, you, along with your universal socket set. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you weren't using the universal socket set and you were using um, regular open end wrenches with the closed end, you could take one of those closed end wrenches, slip it over the end of the, uh, uh, probably use about a half inch, and then slip it over the end of the ground rod, and yeah. just bring it up on an angle, and then it, it'll grip that. Uh, Grip that ground rod, and you can pull it right out of the ground. Yeah. See, that's the way they do it with the metric system. <laughs> <laughs> or or you could use a 13-millimeter open-end wrench with a closed end on the end. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. I've been threatening to do it for a long time, and I, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to it, especially this time of the year. Yeah. I almost did it in the summertime, but it's just too hot to go sit out there around this, this parts of the country. That sounds funny. <laughs> you should come up here in December and try it. <laughs> yeah. it's, usually it's pretty nice in December around here. Well, Mike, you had a uh, what a, a news item? Or... I did. I it's, it's actually this item. one. Well, they're all pretty interesting, but this one really caught my eye because I've been in a lot of virtual meetings uh, lately, and I didn't realize the first virtual meeting uh, occurred in 1916, it linked up uh, 5,100 engineers from Atlanta to San Francisco. 
it goes on to say how they did it. Posted the link there so you can you can read the article. It's not that long, but uh, it's it's pretty interesting the way they coordinated all the uh, telephone systems to work together. And there's also um, comment on the fact that during the meeting, uh, some of the uh, stations along the way, even though they were kept muted, uh, they sent telegrams to the headquarters with their attendance and greetings. So I guess you could think of that as back in 1916, that would have been the chat room. It's pretty interesting. Um, you should check it out. Now, uh, you know, when I first glanced at this, I did not realize that Alexander Graham Bell had a man bun. <laughs> yeah, you know, that kind of struck me funny because I'm not really, I'm going to have to check that out. Uh, I'm not sure that's the right picture. I bought one of these several months ago. They've been out, I don't know how long now, maybe a year. Oh, yeah. I, I'm not sure exactly how long these have been out, but mine's been in the box. And I decided well, I need to pull it out, play with it a little bit, do a project with it. And this is what I came up with. You know, there's more to life than amateur radio. There's also microcontrollers, amongst other things. But if you've watched this show any length of time, you know that we like to play with these, create projects, do different things that um, that we need done. And sometimes just uh, useless stuff. Shazam. That's what I'm going to do today. We're going to take a look, though, at a new microcontroller. I say new because it's not a replacement. The Arduino Uno is probably one of the most popular microcontroller boards ever made. Simplicity, inputs, digital inputs, analog inputs, uh, digital outputs, a variety of functions, serial you can do with it, uh, USB, all kinds of things. A few things that you could not do, but the majority of your simple projects and even a little more complex projects, the Arduino Uno Rev3 was suited for it. Here is the new Arduino Uno Rev4 Wi-Fi. There's two different versions of this. There's an R4 Minima which does not have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth built in and does not have the LED matrix built in either. But it's cheaper. There are a number of things that are different between the two. Basically, the R4 will run most all of the software that would have been written for the Revision 3. There are a few things that it won't run, though, and those are things mostly tied to the chip that was used in the original Arduino Unos. There's a new Renesis chip that's being used here in the Revision 4 models. And if you've got the Wi-Fi version, there's also an ESP32 chip. Now, the ESP32 is a microcontroller in its own right, along with the Wi-Fi radio and Bluetooth radio. However, that's all they're using it for on this board. They're using this Renesis chip over here for everything else. So what's the differences? Well, the Revision 3 was an 8-bit microcontroller. It used the ATmega 328P microcontroller. Now, there's still one very good thing, in my opinion, about this particular model, and that is this microcontroller is in a DIP chip package. So you can build your own PC boards and put a DIP socket on it or solder this directly to the PC board. It's not surface mount, so it's fairly easy to do. doesn't take as much effort as surface mount components do. The R4 Minima and the Wi-Fi both use a 32-bit microcontroller unit. It's the RA4 M1 series from Renesis. There's a USB Type-B connector here on the Revision 3 and earlier Arduino Unos. However, on the R4 version, either the Minima or the Wi-Fi, there's a USB Type-C connector. The Revision 3 had 32 kilobytes of flash RAM memory, while the Minima and the Wi-Fi have 256 kilobytes of flash memory, so quite a big increase in memory size there. The R3 had 2 kilobytes of SRAM, 
The R4 has 32 kilobytes of SRAM. Big increase there. The Revision 4 runs at 48 megahertz. That's three times faster than the Arduino Uno Revision 3. Both of these devices have analog to digital converters. On the original Revision 3, it was only 10 bit resolution. On the Revision 4, it defaults to 10 bits for compatibility with the earlier versions, but you could also set it to do 12-bit or 14-bit resolution, which gives you a lot more detail in the analog signals that you're trying to measure. Revision 3 would operate from 7 to 12 volts. Revision 4, 6 to 24 volts, so a little bit broader there. Revision 3 had no real-time clock built in. The Revision 4 does have a real-time clock, that's uh, day, date, as well as time. Revision 4 also supports CAN bus. You know, that's the bus that's used in automobiles for troubleshooting and controlling things. The R3 didn't have such capabilities. Also, the R4 Wi-Fi has this built-in LED matrix and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Now, the R4 Minima does not have those two, but everything else is the same on it. So that's just a few of the basic differences. There's more to it than that, like you can generate square waves from the digital outputs uh, using pulse width modulated signals on the R3. On the R4, you can actually generate square waves, sine waves, and sawtooth waves. I put together a little project just to show a few of the differences and capabilities of the new Revision 4. This is nowhere near all of it. There would not be enough time in an entire show to cover it. Maybe we'll look at some of the other possibilities in the future. Here's the connections I made to the Arduino Uno R4 Wi-Fi module. Starting at the bottom, you'll see we've got 5 volts input. Right next to that, we've got ground. Then we've got the analog inputs. Those are the ones we're going to be using here on the bottom. You can connect your power supply straight into the 5 volt input of the Arduino Uno, or you can use a USB C cable to power the device. If you look down below 5 volts there, you'll see a 5K ohm pot. The wiper on that pot goes over to A5. What we're doing is sampling the voltage off of that pot into the analog 5 input. We're going to use that for speed control for a routine that we've got in the program. A0 is going to be an analog output. Now, we didn't have that on the Revision 3 Arduino, so we're going to get a sine wave out of that A0 port, and I've got a 10K ohm pot that's going to be used to adjust volume with. And here's another thing that we didn't have on the Arduino Uno Revision 4. There is an op-amp circuit built into the microcontroller here. It uses pins A1 as an op-amp positive input, A2 as the negative input, and A3 as the op-amp output. The sine wave is going to be kind of low coming out of this analog output. We'll use the op-amp circuit, turn it on, so that we've got a little amplifier to drive our speaker out there. 10K ohm pot then it's going to feed A1, which is our positive input to the op amp, and we can just adjust our volume there. You need those two 10K ohm resistors below A3. That's to make the op amp circuit function. And you can see I put a 47 microfarad capacitor out before the speaker to DC isolate the speaker, and also a little 470 ohm resistor to isolate the speaker a little bit from the op-amp output. Up above, you can see digital inputs 1, 2, and 3. I have three push buttons. Rather than use pull-up resistors, I just use the pull-up command inside the Arduino Uno language. Three different buttons. The first one is going to play a 1 kilohertz tone. The second one is going to play random tones. And the third one is for a special test mode I set up. There's really not enough time to dig into the code here. I'm just going to do a brief rundown of it. At the top, we've just got some comments up here. 
and some information to some web links that you can find more details on how to use some of these commands. We're going to include a few header files here. Uh, we've got the portion of the program that initializes it, then the setup function that always runs anytime you start an Arduino Uno, and then we've got a loop function that is the main part of the program that it's sitting there constantly running through. Below that, I've got a couple of other functions here. There's a void 1K tone. This is a function that plays 1000 hertz. Very simple, just one line of code. And then there's a function here called rand tones that plays random tones. It just generates a random number, plays that frequency, and it also displays some frames that we edited using the Arduino Matrix LED editor. And that's all the code there is. If you take out the blank lines, it's less than 100 lines of code. So what does this do? Let's take a look. We've got our dual trace oscilloscope set up here. The number one channel is connected to the output of the oscillator, which is on A0. Channel 2 is connected to the output of the op amp. So let's see what we got. First thing, if we hit the reset button to start up the Arduino here, we got text, amateurlogic.tv, scrolls across one time. Only a few lines of code are necessary to do that. Now I've got three little buttons connected down here. The first button, if I touch it, that's going to give us a one kilohertz tone. Now, of course, we're looking at the output of A0. Now, we can see this is a little odd looking. It is a sine wave, but you can see these little steps here. That's where they approximated it and switched it on and off to create a sine wave. So, not a perfect sign, but nevertheless, it is a sign. We can see on the output of the op amp here, that's not exactly uh, what you would call a sine wave there either. It did smooth out those bumps on there, but you'll notice it's a little flat here on the bottom as we start increasing the gain. Uh, you'll notice it starts flat topping there. That's where we're getting into distortion. So no matter where we run the gain, it's never a perfect sign, but it does give us a lot more volume than we would get just straight out of analog zero. That's pretty low signal there. The second button runs our sequence of random tones. We've got the LED display just flashing random LEDs. There is a pattern to it. If you watch close enough, you'd eventually figure it out. But I used a little animation to put that together just so simulate uh, computer thinking. And you can see the frequencies of the tones are varying here. This is something I thought that Dean Martin could use on Ham College. Sometimes he just takes a uh, wild guess on one of the answers. This will help do that. We'll use our great computer here to randomly generate an answer since all the questions are multiple choice, A through D. You can press the third button. B. The answer is B. Whether or not that's correct, I don't know. It's just a random chance. A. And it's a 1 in 4 chance it could be any of these. So we got a D. If you keep pressing it, you'll eventually get a... Well, there's another D. You'll eventually get a C, a B, an A, or a D. Just whatever. D seems to be a particularly heavy odds tonight. There we go. We finally got a C. I just wanted to be able to demonstrate a couple of things on the Rev 4 of the Arduino Uno Wi-Fi here. This is the first version of the Uno that's got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built into it. We're not even going to look at those tonight. All we did is look at the analog input and we changed the A to D converter. On the Rev 4, you only got a 10-bit A to D. 
On here, you can go 12 or 14 bits, so I stepped it up to 14 bits. So we've got uh, a wider variety of voltages that we're sampling. It's 0 to 5 volts, but there's a lot more steps to it. Also, I wanted to demonstrate the LED, and we're just doing text here with the A, B, C, or D. Our scrolling amateurlogic.tv when we first started up. And I'm using frames with the uh, Matrix LED frame editor just to flash some random frames on there to make it look like uh, the thing's thinking. And I guess you could call it AI or ABCD. Maybe RI is a better name. Random Intelligence. That's pretty good. Be sure, yeah. be sure to power that thing up next uh, in a couple of weeks. I am. We're going to see how it does on a test. Okay. This holiday season, elevate the amateur radio experience with ICOM. ICOM's top-tier transceivers and innovative features make the perfect gift for any ham radio enthusiast. Built tough for outdoor use and emergencies, ICOM's handheld radios offer reliable performance, longer battery life, and clear signal quality. Beginners will love the ID50A for hours of fun and enjoyment. Easy D-Star settings, band scope with waterfall display, voice messaging, and share picture function. The ID52A is the first handheld amateur radio with a full color 2.3 inch waterfall display. The IC705 and IC7300 are the go to rigs for outdoor hams who love POTA and SOTA activations. Both radios feature a large touchscreen with real time spectrum scope and waterfall display for intuitive functions and setting operations. The IC705 provides base station features and performance in the palm of your hand. The IC7300 is the industry's first to use RF direct sampling system in an entry-level HF radio. ICOM's amateur base stations provide hams with powerful performance, clear signals, and long-distance communication. With versatile frequency coverage, superior receiver sensitivity, and easy-to-use interfaces, they suit both beginners and experienced operators. With the IC7610, faint signals are no longer challenging for DXers or contesters. The new IC7760 offers a modern connected system with a separate remote control head and RF deck linked via a standard LAN cable. With the ICPW2, take your contesting experience to the next level with ICOM's industry-first linear amplifier, which includes digital pre-distortion and a built-in 2x6 automatic antenna selector for single operator to radio operation. For more information about ICOM's amateur radios, visit icomamerica.com slash amateur. Happy holidays, and may your signals be strong all year long. If anybody happens to be in the Kingston, Ontario area, you have to check it out. I actually stumbled upon it by accident. I did not, I was not intending to go there, but when I walked in there, it's like, whoa, <laughs> have a look. The, uh, the interior is all, it's a little disjointed uh, with the various displays because it's really jam-packed. And I tried to do it in order of eras, uh, World War One, starting out with World War One, going to two, and then uh, carrying on from there. But uh, it's interesting stuff, like, the, uh, like this transmitter, circa 1916, uh, Morse code, Spark app. Uh, telephone, I don't know. It says telephone exchange, but I, are they exchanging for sandbags? I don't know. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I'm not sure about that uh, that spark gap transmitter. Those uh, those tubular or cylindrical objects there. Um, I 
I read on that, uh, I blew up the image, and it said Edison Swan, Edison dash Swan. So I'm not sure hmm. if those are coils or or what exactly they are. But um, anyway, they're interesting. I, I you'll see that in another uh, spark gap transmitter. Hmm. Swan. Every, every, there's a spark gap wireless receiver. Everything, every receiver is a spark gap receiver, isn't it? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if it detects AM, it'll detect spark caps. And that's that's the um, apparently an early 20th century Canadian Forces communication classroom uh, where they uh, did teaching. That's um, pretty cool. And there's our uh, there's our, our plaque. Apparently, this was on the uh, on the outside of the uh, Department of Natural Defense's uh, Royal Canadian Corps. Um, and and there's a there's a fellow there sporting a Canadian tuxedo. Yeah, I was going to say he, he close it to the same place. But he he doesn't have any beers. Okay. No, they're <laughs> under the desk, I guess. Oh, to okay. Keep, <laughs> out in the snow. Keep them out of sight. <laughs> and this is a uh, I think a 1930s vintage uh, mobile uh, radio. And I'm not sure when it, where or how it was used, but uh, it was designed for for mobile operation. Look at that hat, man! It's a nice yeah. hat. And here we're we're getting into World War II. Um, I think this is uh, this was made by Northern Telecom. And whenever I think of Northern Telecom, I I immediately think of telephone equipment. But I guess during the war, they made uh, military radio equipment as well. So what was the rock for adjusting frequency? Um, I'm not really <laughs> sure what that rock is for. It's got some scrapes on it, yeah. so maybe it was used to adjust the radio. Oh, could, yeah. I don't know. Oh, this is interesting. This is a um, Model 10, and it's a uh, it's the first microwave uh, relay telephone system. It's a multi-channel, and it was used during the uh, D-Day invasion, and uh, I guess it, uh, it, it it was really valued for the communications it was able to uh, send back and forth. Yeah, I guess there'd be multiple advantages to that in that era. First, multi-channel, and then being yeah. microwave, it, you know. Yeah, exactly. kind of Because I guess the hear. problem was, up until this time, radio... Radios were were all lower HF, and they they relied on for any distance. They relied on skip, obviously, for any communications distance. And uh, whereas this was uh, microwave, uh, you, as long as you had line of sight, you could uh, you could get communications. They used to have the the equipment set up in these in these trucks or these vans, and they would park them on um, you know strategically placed uh, high points. This is Canada's spy school, Camp X. There's a series out there that I watched, and, and it was Canada's spy school. They trained agents. It had a radio uh, comm center during the uh, Second World War. They used to keep in communication uh, with, uh, with uh, Britain and the rest of the Allies, uh, the most powerful shortwave radio communications uh, system at, at the time. And interestingly, it was created by a few uh, Canadian amateurs. Um, huh. And uh, if you read, uh, if you go to Wikipedia and, and you search for Hydra World War II radio, uh, it, it speaks about uh, buying, getting bits and pieces from various places, and one of them was from, they got a 10 kilowatt uh, transmitter, um, I think from either Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, I can't remember, um, somewhere in Pennsylvania anyway, um, and that transmitter apparently uh, when it was all hooked up as a system, it was way out of its time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was uh, surprised to see that but um you know they hit they hid radios in in their bunks obviously uh they didn't want to be caught with one of those but they found ingenious ways of, uh, of hiding them this is uh i guess uh radar is is uh, particularly for the uh the merchant marines is a big deal that was a, a real lifesaver for them this slide here i couldn't get the clarity uh too well obviously the, the the one on the on the top left is an oscilloscope but there's some other various pieces of test gear 
um, that was used uh, when servicing, uh, you know, the, the the army radios and such. It looks like Tommy's meter there. No, that's not Earth, Moon, Earth. Yeah, this is interesting, uh, and I can remember at the time when these were the big deal, the uh, the M seven thousands from uh, from Universal Radio, uh, being able to decode some of those mystery signals that you heard on shortwave. And obviously, uh, the military g- got onto those as well. What is it, M7000? Yeah, from Universal Radio in Ohio. Hmm. I've been there before. And there's another one there. This time, there's a, there's a video monitor there. I guess they had it hooked up. I'd like to have one of those Raycal receivers, too. <laughs> yeah, if you read the little card there, it says, Contra Choice in Handheld Radio. Andy Com. So we've left the World War II area. I saw this. I wasn't sure what quite to make of it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Apparently, it's the um, military communications for Central Africa at the time. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, probably not at that time, but probably at a time it was. Yeah. Early uh, teletype and cipher uh, machines. Uh, we'll we'll see the Enigma machine later on, but um, these are the earlier ones. Obviously, they weren't around too long because they probably um, were, were uh, the code was broken pretty uh, pretty easily, so they they didn't stick around too long. There's the uh, the Enigma machine. This one you can tell it's got it's only got the four rotors, so I'm assuming that would be one of the earlier Enigma machines. I still think of the the model kit that uh, the working Enigma kit that Chip built. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. It's this one. Oh yeah. This is other equipment. This is encryption for phone and um, radio. They had a display of these uh, vacuum tubes, more radios, and the uh, RDF on the right there, the top right. Yeah. Is pretty interesting. And more radios. Can't have too many. That's right. That's what I'm saying. And and keys. Um, yeah, I noticed, Tommy, um, you shouldn't keep those uh, handy talkies on your shelf there because they multiply like rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are uh, teletype machines. I had one of those Model 17 teletypes uh, when I first got licensed. I used to use it for RTTY. Boy, that wow. thing was noisy when you fired it up. Yeah, we used to have one of those. I don't know which one it was. It's one of those models or not, but um, we had had them at radio stations back in the day. That's how you got the news. That's right. And the uh, analog phone line would get noisy, and it would go to hallucinating. We <laughs> called it garble, but it was you call it hallucinating now. Because it just, you'd be reading down a news story and going all along and everything's fine. You better look at that news ahead of time because all of a sudden it's all these words you can't pronounce. Oh, yeah, I got a new production company. (laughs) That's a trick there. That's that's all. You, you, You notice the grooves in that dish? We had to get them in that dish because... You, you put food in a regular bowl, and you turn your head and turn back and look at him. The food would be gone. It's like he just inhaled it. So that bowl design is supposed to make him slow down, but he's figured out a way. <laughs> just kind of drives around in circles and scoops it all in his mouth anyway. So wow. he's, he figured that out in a couple of days. He can he can he can empty the bowl in almost the same amount of time by going in circles. Wow. That's good stuff, Mike. I've seen something similar. I'm trying to think of what ham fest it was. Some ham fest I was at that had a display similar to that, but it was not that same stuff, but it was World War II era. Yeah? Had a ham fest? Yeah, it may have been out west somewhere. Somewhere I I saw a... Hmm. It may have been Huntsville one year. I can't remember where it was. My son and I are thinking about going back to... England for one last trip. We're planning on going by the park over there to see the vending machine and all that. Oh, Are you going to activate it? Fletcher Park. Yeah, Fletcher Park. Uh, Fletcher Park. Yep. Yeah. Wow. 
I'd like to get over there. I didn't I didn't get over into that area, but it would be really interesting to see that uh, that yeah. uh, Turing machine, I guess you could call it. Yeah, yeah. If I do, I'll send. I'll have to take plenty of pictures when I'm. There. This is from our friend Kevin ZL1 KFM down in New Zealand. It says morning all. Look at that antenna analyzer. Something that's been missing in my gear for a long time. At home, I always used an SWR meter from the radio. Tried a VNA. Worked, but a little cumbersome. So seeing that HRO and a few other companies have specials for the rig expert units, I was thinking about getting one. What are your thoughts on what to get? You don't need the units that cover 1 gigahertz, but looking at the two listed below, the AA650 Zoom and Rig Expert Stick X Pro, which I'm not familiar with those, but uh, I was going to ask for uh, suggestions of what people thought a good one was nowadays, because mm -hmm. I, I don't know them very well. But I did find out that he already he bought the AA650 Zoom, but uh, still oh, okay. kind of curious. What, I was, uh, was going to say the Rig Expert, that's top shelf stuff. Yeah, yeah, it looks it's nice. I used George's uh, one day over here to test my antenna. Well, mine's a a two thirty zoom, so it's several models down from. Oh yeah. What Kevin got there? I have it, to look it up. That'll be, go a higher frequency. That'll cover UHF. Yeah. Mine won't. The only thing about the is the interface seemed a little bit weird till you figure out how to use it, but then it's a problem. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit strange to me. It's it's one of my favorites. Yeah. The only thing, and I don't know about these other. Uh, models of rig experts there the only thing i don't like about mine is you hit the button it sweeps one time and you gotta you get the trace uh -huh. it's not continuously sweeping oh that's so why you were you, asking me about my UK. yes one. so every time you make a change you have to you know, hit the button to yeah. to sweep Trigger again. again. Yeah. I liked the little U kits when I showed on my segment. You've mm -hmm. seen it before. You had yeah. it for, uh, from MFJ. I don't, I don't even know, know if they if even still make them or not. I, d I don't know. But anyway, it's really nice. It's so simple. It's really easy to use. Yeah. That little battery and it lasts eternity too. It's got two two in it. Well, Tommy, I know you're planning on going in the morning, head down to Slidell. I am. What are you going to be doing Tuesday night? Ah, this is a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you. I'm glad you did it though, because uh, it's sn sneaking up on me. We're gonna be doing the net, the uh, logic net. It's uh, you and I, I think, aren't? We? Yeah, you, yeah. You and I are going to be calling it this time. So, it's actually the 26th, right before Thanksgiving. So it's so not it's, this coming week. It's the it's on two week. Tuesdays. Okay. You, does that yeah, work better for you? Yeah, it does. Because <laughs> okay. kind of, that's more like what I was expecting. Check in with us. We'll be glad to hear from you. Um, the The list of connections has changed, so take note of the slide here, and there'll be a uh, a reminder sent out with this information on it right before the net too. So yeah, all the places you get info on Amateur Logic, Facebook, uh, uh, X. I guess it gets on X. Mm hmm. Uh, groups.io this will be yeah, posted all the usual the places so yep. be, be sure to check mm -hmm. it good and uh, or check it before set a reminder because it's always the fourth Tuesday of the month now we were trying to do it after the show but it changed around and it's kind of hard for people to keep up with so it's yeah. always the fourth Tuesday of the month now so you can kind of set your reminders on your, your phone or your calendar or whatever you're going to do you know, since my shirt crashed over here, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to be looking for a wardrobe. You yeah, got any suggestions, email? Yeah, because that, that one gives me heartburn when I see yeah. it. Yeah, I would say you you could visit the uh, shop.spreadshirt.com/slash/amateurlogic site and get you some snazzy uh, uh, apparel and and mugs and other things. What do you think, George? Well, you know, that might work out. They're uh, guaranteed not to crash. We haven't had one crash yet. Not yet. Uh, I've got one that looks a little ragged that's been worn for uh, I don't know how many years. They're still but, chugging along. Yeah. Well, oh, they've. Did they, are the mugs in there as well? I, that mug you've got there didn't come from there, Mel. Yeah, there's, there's okay. mugs that's in there. That's a special there. one? That's yes. a special one, Mike. That's a graduation mug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's mugs, cups, backpacks, everything. A lot, a lot of stuff in there. So you might not know that. There's a lot of things that you might not know that 
If you need to keep up with stuff, where could you do that, Mike? Facebook.com slash groups slash amateurlogic.tv. Yeah. You can follow us at Amateur Logic on Twitter, too, or X or whatever you want to call it this week. Yeah. Or you could visit groups.io slash G slash Amateur Logic. Well, you don't really visit that. You sign up there, and then uh, groups.io will send out an email whenever we or any group member releases a post. But it's generally only going to be uh, announcing when there's going to be a, a show coming up or when the recorded episode has posted. Or the net. Or the net. And, and stuff like that. That's Basically you announcements. Won't, you, you won't get spammed from no. You won't get to oh, I like their I like their weekly digest. You can subscribe to a weekly digest. If you have a let's say you're you're following a group that's pretty active, you don't have time to read them all. Right. You can just get the the, the the digest and it sends you one email, gives you kind of like the reader's digest uh, condensed version. And you know, sometimes the editors of the segments here on Amateur Logic fail to put a link to what they were talking about in there. Like, uh, I think that happened at least twice tonight. <laughs> How, what could you do if you watch the video and the link is not there? Well, you can go to the wiki, uh, amateurlogic.tv forward slash wiki. The, the wiki meister kind of puts that stuff all together. Yeah. Um, as long as they were included in the show notes. In yeah. The, uh, doc. But, yeah. Okay. Well, it's not right here, but it, when I printed this out, but it is now, uh, where you can, the real, you can download it. the schematic and the code for the um, circuit that I did tonight and the, the project there, if you want to play with it yourself. Yeah, the park's on there. Stuff will be there. But, uh, oh, most of the stuff from the show's in there that's, that you need. We'd appreciate it if, if you enjoyed the show tonight. Click that little like button wherever it is down there. Click the share button as well. Get a link that you can share with your friends, even your enemies. You might want to <laughs> have some of your enemies watch Amateur Logic. Just spread the I word. I don't know. <laughs> that's right. Love your enemies, right? Yep. Yeah. That's what there they say. Go. Well, before we get out of here, any final thoughts tonight, Tommy? No, looking forward to going and visiting uh, Mill and Glenn at the Ham Fest and... Uh, I'll have some video of that coming up. I'm going to be going to do in the parks on there, too, but I'll probably show the Ham Fest video next if I get some good stuff. But yeah. anyway, see you guys tomorrow. Email? Does anybody live stream? Will there be good stuff? There'll be good stuff, no doubt. I'll have uh, I'm given a forum on some digital modes, give some updates from uh, I usually do that uh, at the Ham Fest, and plus uh, helping them out there with some of their other stuff, but always a good member of that club, W5SLA. Uh, we got our field day scores, too, and we did above uh, what we normally do. Uh, I think they published them already in the latest QST, so it's pretty good stuff. I, I, I'm sure y'all maybe saw y'all's, too, huh? Uh, what's the uh, club? AX, AXC, is it? Yeah. W5AXC. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I well, on email, be, be sure to open your wallet up before you go inside the flea market. You don't want all those moss coming out in the middle of that uh, flea market, <laughs> scaring <laughs> folks away. Have you put another dollar in there since Dayton two years ago? Yes, yes, I uh, put another dollar on. And uh, the uh, there is a, a good a vendor coming down who I've never seen or done out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, Chat Radio is going to be down yeah. there that way. Yeah. So I'm cool. looking forward to see what he brings down. Yeah, they they do a good display. Yeah. Mike, any final thoughts from the Great White North? Um, uh, let's see. Uh, not really. Things are uh, things at work are are still crazy busy, but um, around the house here, things are starting to calm down a little bit. With the colder weather, you're not able to do so much outside. The greenhouse is finished and. Uh, I, I got to learn what uh, 15 tons of stone <laughs> was uh, in terms of uh, quantity because I had 15 tons of stone delivered um, to spread out. Actually, they were limestone screenings to spread out around the greenhouse, 
which thankfully is now finished. It's got a door on it, and it's all enclosed. So the only thing left to do is uh, to do a little bit of um, uh, arranging of uh, of things. And, and uh, there's a pergola that I have to put on the front next year. But that's going to be in the spring or, or summer. A couple of Tuesdays from now, November 26th, join Tommy and I on the Logic Net. We're going to skip Christmas, the uh, Christmas one, the December one, because it yeah. falls too close to Christmas time. Mm-hmm. So we're going to skip that one, but we'll be back on January. Thanks for being here tonight, everyone. We enjoyed it as always. Look forward to seeing you around the middle of December for the next Amateur Logic. Until then, live long and prosper. Keep your intelligence Seven, random. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Live long and prosper. I, I I can't do it. I I, I got. I don't have any trouble. Well, maybe a little. Yep. Nanu nanu. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> That'll work too. Or, or what was that uh, dude? Where's my car? Zoltan or something like that. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Seven three. Seven three. Seven three. Everybody. Good night. Seven three.